God bless you. Praise the Lord. How many of you are glad to be here today? Come on, can we wave those hands to the Lord? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for light. We receive, Lord, the, 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 the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the knowledge of you, the eyes of our understanding is enlightened that we may know the hope of your calling, the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, the exceeding greatness of your power toward, world, I mean, toward us who believe according to the walking of your mighty power. Lord, glorify yourself again tonight. We lift you up in this place. We crown you Lord of, of Lord and kings of kings. We ask, O oh God, that you will reign supreme in this place. Speak to your people, O oh God, in clear terms that even a child can understand. The Bible says in the day, on the day of Pentecost, it said, every one of them had, the, had them speak in his own dialect. And so we trust today that you will speak to everyone in their own language. Amen. We give you honor and glory. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name, O God. Amen. Thank you, Father, for averting things today. Thank you. Thank you for causing light to break open in our darkness. Thank you, Father, for advancing the cause of your people. We give you glory and honor. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. Thank you again. Thank you, Pastor Fumi. For this wonderful opportunity to share the word of God. How many of you um, have learned so far? If you've been here these two days, um, even though well, we've been teaching here and there, praise God. Last night I talked about, um, you know, fulfilling your prophetic word. And um, I believe I'll conclude that tomorrow. <laughs> there are just two things I will add to it. And I trust that that will do so. All right. But this morning we talked about the theme of this meeting. Praise the Lord. How many of you can remind me of the theme of the meeting again? Treasure in earthen vessels. Praise the Lord. And we discovered that, um, you know, the, the, we have a treasure, but we also have treasures. The treasure is the glory of God that we have inside of us. So we carry Jesus everywhere, which is the representation of the fullness of God's glory. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Hallelujah. So when you see Jesus, you have seen the Father. If you have Jesus, you have the Father. If you have Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. You know, oftentimes we say um, when people receive Jesus or when we give our lives to Jesus, I don't know which one is right now, you give your life to him. Amen. Or you receive him. You receive him. You don't give your life to him because even after you receive him, there are still people who have not given their lives. All right. Okay, so, so when we receive Jesus, we normally see Jesus is now living in you. Is that not so? Yes, but in the recent of you, how many of you know that Jesus in person is not living in you? He's living in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So actually the Holy Spirit is the one living in you. Yes. That's why we read earlier or read this morning from um, Romans, I mean, sorry, uh, first, Second Corinthians chapter 3. And we read in verse 17, it says, now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. In other words, if the Holy Spirit is in you, then Jesus, the spirit of Jesus is in you. And if the spirit of Jesus is in you, it means the Father is actually living in you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, this evening, I, I want to teach along the side of some of the things we said in the morning. Um, you know, we talked about gifts, the gift of, of gifts of grace. Praise the Lord. And I said to every one of us has been given what gifts according to scripture. The Bible says each one of us has been given what gifts according to the measure of grace. And I said, we don't all have the same grace because we don't all have the same gifts. Am I communicating? Yes, so based on our gifts, you also have grace. Praise the Lord. So tonight, I just want to um, read and explain further um, about gifts and how you can connect with your gift. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have your Bible, let's go to Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. Hallelujah. And I will read it if you're there from maybe a couple of versions. I have some versions here. So if one of you can get that, I'll just quickly do so. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now look at it with me. Scripture reads, it says, For the gifts and the calling of God are what? Irrevocable. That's New King James. The gifts and calling of God of God are irrevocable. Okay, let's look at it in the, new, in the King James Version, if we can project that. 
King James says, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, I don't know how many versions you have there, but anyone you have just projected other than the first two we have read. But if you don't, we read some others. Okay, Amplified. Thank you for Amplified. Amplified says, for the gifts and the calling of God are what? Irrevocable. For he does not withdraw what he has given, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends I like the word sends is called now let's dwell with the scripture today now the first thing you'll find about this scripture is that it says the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable number two he says God does not change his mind about them to whom he has given his gifts or who he has given his call. Praise the Lord. Which means, listen to me, if there's one thing God cannot change, is to deposit a gift and God to take it away. He can't from this scripture. Now sometimes, you know, as people we think, well, maybe God is offended, so he has taken some gifts away from us. No, this scripture categorically established that that it's not possible for God to take a gift away. Praise the Lord. Now let me tell you something maybe that will shock you. How many of you know that God never took the gift that Satan had away from him? God never did. Because the Bible says when God gives a gift, he can't take that gift away. Are you understanding me? So God didn't take that away. That's why the, the what he had, this morning we talked a little bit about, about Satan, the anointed cherub, he had wisdom. God deposited the gift of wisdom in him. He had ability to do certain things. God didn't take that away from him. Now, when he became the devil, those gifts were still functional. The only thing is God was not the one controlling them anymore. Now, that's why somebody can be anointed, all right, but you will find that that anointing, when the person, for example, okay, let me, let me rephrase that. Uh, somebody can be a child of God, and God can deposit gifts in that person. Now, if the person pulls away and goes, you know, to become a child, permit me in quote, the child of the devil, those gifts will not be withdrawn. They will still be there. They only become instruments that the enemy can use to propagate his own, you know, his own kingdom. All right? Or his own agenda. Now, so you find out that somebody uh, can have the gift of God upon him. If God gives a gift, he doesn't withdraw them. He doesn't change his mind about them. Praise the Lord. Now, this is quite interesting to me because uh, for years, you know, I, I was bothered because I used to think maybe, well, God must have, maybe some have offended God somehow. Uh, maybe God decided to change his mind about some things he gave me. Until, you know, just keep studying, keep studying. That's why we need to stay with the Holy Spirit. And then eventually, this scripture popped open, and then I read it in many other translations. Then, oh, you mean God never withdraws his gifts and his call. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's the first thing I want you to take note of. That God does not change his mind about the things he has given to you. Now, you may not, you may think those things are no more functional. It doesn't mean God has withdrawn them. It only means you are not doing the right thing to get them. They are still there inside of you. They never left you one day. Just like Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How many of you know that sometimes things are tough around you and you think, am I sure God is still around? Where is he? If he's still there, how come I'm not feeling him? He's there. A man had a revelation. And in that revelation, he saw full print on the sand by the seashore. All right? You know, by the seashore, the sand, when you put your leg there, it makes a, uh, there's a print. Yeah. All right? When you leave, somebody can tell, uh, somebody will just walk there. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. So this man, in that vision, he saw um, two, okay, four footprints, which means two people were walking on that, you know, uh, sand by the seashore. You understand? Mm -hmm. So he saw four, then suddenly, interval, he will see two. 
And then after a while, he will see four. And so he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, what does it mean? He said, the time you saw four, it's you and I walking. It's okay, what of the two? He said, that is when you were tired and I was carrying you. Hallelujah. Amen. That blessed me. Because it means even when you think God is not working, he's working. It's just that you don't know. So when things are tough and they are quiet, you don't think anything. Sometimes it looks like, is God still around? Where is he? How many of you, do you go through that? Okay, even me, I still go through that. Because even in quietness, God is still talking. Be still and know that I am God. So even when we are quiet, when things are not per se happening, you know, in the physical, God is still with you. How many of you know you will know if you have left God? Yes, Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God explained that scripture to me and he blessed me. God said, I never live where I told you I will be. It is you who lives. It's you who left. So when you leave, the father, um, uh, let's assume that Pastor Fumi represents God, okay? She's not God, but represent uh, because of my teaching. Now, how many of you know I'm close to God now? Now, watch what I'm going to do. Pastor Fumi will never leave this seat. So God never leaves his seat. The further I stay away from Pastor Fumi, the further I am from her. Is that not so? All right, so God never left. So when the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you, it doesn't mean God is moving close to you. No, you are the one coming back. The closer you come, the closer God gets to you. The closer you come, that's why the prodigal son had to return. Did you notice that the father never go looking for him? The father will only stand on his balcony and wondering, when will this son come back? I know he'll come back. Something will happen, he'll come back. But we never heard that the father, in fact, it's funny that the father didn't even send people after the son. Can you go and look for my son, please? Huh? He was just standing and waiting, expecting. He knew his son will come back. How many of you know that God was not surprised the day you gave your life to Jesus? Oh, because he saw you in Christ. So when you came, that's why there was party in heaven the day you gave your life to Jesus. So when people get saved, like I said yesterday, God rejoices, he's, he's glad. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, so the gifts and the calling of God, the scripture says they are what? Without repentance. Now, let, let's take note. I've already explained to you that these gifts, God does not withdraw them. God does not change his mind about them. Am I communicating? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Okay, so let's assume that God should send a man or God should give a gift to a man and send him. Let's assume to, um, where am I going to say use now? Um, maybe to Maraba. I think there's a place called Maraba. Okay, and God should send him there. And the man chooses not to go to Maraba. Now, how many of you know that that gift and that calling will still be there? God has not changed his mind about you. God will not say, oh, this man refused to go. Therefore, um, let me look for somebody else. God will, but it doesn't mean that gift has left. Some other person may be doing something that looks like that. But the day the person comes back to God, he will still find out that God is still telling him, Maraba, Maraba, Maraba. You say, even after 20 years, Maraba. Why? Because you see... God, in his calling, all right, your calling, or what God has called you to do, is part of God's eternal plan. So he can't change it. For God to change it, it means God will have to go back. All right? And if God is going to do that, it means he have to go back. You know, not just go back to the beginning of creation. Okay, maybe the beginning of creation because the creation, creation of God or God's creation didn't start with heaven and earth. I'm sure you know that. God's creation started in the spirit. Somebody once asked me, I went to a Bible school. He said, uh, sir, where will God be when this world, because the Bible says the heavens and the earth will be folded up. I said, where was God before God created the heavens and the earth? That's where you will go back to. That's where God will be. He has never changed the location. That's where he is. Now, but that's not what I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying? It's because the guys ask a very funny question. So I say, where do you think God was when he created? How many of you know God was not in heaven? If God was in heaven, that would be funny. 
Because the Bible says God created in the beginning, in the beginning. That word beginning means dateless past, which means we don't know when, when. We just know mm, at the very, very beginning. Now, if you read, you'll find out that John 1, 1 makes us understand in the beginning. The beginning was what? Was the word. So, the beginning of God was his word. It was when he spoke. God spoke the beginning into existence. The beginning began with God speaking. That's why every beginning that God will begin with you, he says it. So when God speaks to you and you receive it, whoo, something has started. If God wants to change a cause, how does he do it? He speaks. When he speaks it, your cause changes. Am I communicating? You can always tell when God is starting something new by what he's saying. You can also tell when God is saying, I am concluding a chapter and I'm about to open another one. You can always know by what God says. Behold, I do a new thing. Scripture will say, Isaiah chapter, don't go there. You know, I will just quote it. You can write it down. In Isaiah chapter 43, and I believe as 18 and 19, he said, remember, you know, the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I do a new thing. Hallelujah. Then he says, now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. What was God saying? God was speaking to a people who knew him as the God. They had stories. Oh, that God made a way in the Red Sea. God made a way in the Red Sea. And those people celebrated what God did in the past. And God was now speaking to them and saying, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The people God was speaking to were people in Babylon. And God was saying, remember you not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Why? Because sometimes old can stop you from new. How many of you know that? If you keep looking behind, let's assume that you turn, you are running a race. Hmm? What will happen? It will hinder your speed. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, you are advised that when you run a race, put your eye on the target. Yes. Believe that you are, the, you are going to take it. But if you keep, oh, who is who's coming close to me? Now, that will reduce your speed and then they can overtake you. So, what do we do? We, don't, we find out that we don't walk. While you are trying to reach your goal, you are not looking back. Is that not so? Because if you look back, it means you'll be hindered. And that will hinder your speed from reaching into what God wants. Okay? That's just by passing. So he said, I'll do a new thing. So when God wants to do something new, how does he do it? By revelation and uh, truth. By his revelation and truth, which means the word of God. When God speaks to you, a new beginning began. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Now, so... We discover that God does not change his mind about his gift. Now, but look at that first part. You find the word gifts. And then you find the word calling. Now, there are many gifts. The word gifts, plural. The word calling, singular. In other words, you have many gifts, but you have one calling. Amen. Amen. Which means every one of us seated here, the reason why God gives us gifts is for calling. The reason why you have gifts is because of a calling. If you don't have a calling, you don't need the gifts. Gifts are equipment. Calling are assignment. What you are assigned to do. So your calling is your assignment. Your gifts are what? Your equipment. So when you want somebody to do a good job, don't you equip that person? You equip the person. So your gift is not the major. Your gift is the minor. The major is the calling. So we have many gifts, but we have one calling. Now listen to me and hear me tonight. Every one of us seated here, every human being in the world, past and present, we all have an assignment. Now what is your assignment? Your assignment is what God created you for, period. That's what you call purpose. Am I communicating? Yes, now, can we, can we, we will come back here, but let me read a scripture in Colossians chapter 4 
and verse 17, Colossians 4, 17, Paul writing to that church, eventually remember the young man by the name Archippus. He says, and say to Archippus, see to it that you fulfill carefully the duty of the ministry which you have received in the Lord. Hallelujah. So he's saying to Archippus, he said, Archippus, because he remembered Archippus. Now, I want to believe that Archippus is one of those faithful people in that church, but yet, even though he was faithful, maybe he was faithful, maybe he was unfaithful, we don't know, but he was one person that Paul remembered while the Holy Spirit was writing. You remember how I explained that this morning? And while he was writing, suddenly he remembered the Holy Spirit said, Archippus. Archippus was a man in that church. I'm sure he was well known, but yet he wasn't fulfilling ministry. So he wasn't doing his assignment. And Paul had to write to him, make sure that you execute, hallelujah, Amen. to the fullest, the duty of ministry that has been given to you. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Now watch what I'm going to say so that you can stay with me. That we have just one assignment. We don't have many assignments. Amen. Now, everything that is created has only one function. Do you agree with me? For example, this microphone. What is the purpose of this microphone? To amplify my sound, my voice. Is it doing that? But you see, it's funny that the microphone alone cannot amplify my voice. If you switch up, don't connect it to the amplifier and see if it will work. Now, you can also connect it to the amplifier. Amplifier, If there's no power, it also doesn't work. Did you get what I'm saying to you? Yes. Now, so you find out that it is important for you to connect with your purpose or your destiny, if you like, okay, purpose, your assignment. Why? Because there are many other people's lives that are tied to yours. So, just like this microphone, you can imagine we have the microphone. Say, ah, you know, Pastor Fumi says, what do we need? We need microphone. We don't have microphone. We need microphone. Then somebody goes to get microphone. And then we bring microphone and microphone, we, we are shouting, you are not hearing me. Then we get to know that, oh, microphone doesn't work alone. We need an amplifier. It's okay, we have amplifier, but there's no power. Then we discover, oh, we need to get a gen. And when we get the gen, the gen does not work without fuel. <laughs> and then fuel doesn't come without money. Because there's no fuel that comes from heaven. <laughs> Is there fuel that comes from heaven? Have you received that before? You just say, Lord Jesus. Mm. I like the fuel of heaven. Don't you, won't you like that one? But it doesn't exist. There's no fuel in heaven because they don't use generator there. Jesus is the light of that world. And so we don't need it. All right, now, so follow what I'm saying. So we find out that this microphone now, it's fulfilling what? Its purpose. The manufacturer, or sorry, the inventor, had something in mind. He must have saw, seen a, a problem. How many, you know, how many of you know, also know before I further, to, uh, further explain that every invention is to Thank you. To solve a problem. Listen, you know why God created you? To solve a problem. You are not here to be a problem. You are a problem solver. Or problem, as we call it, huh? solution provider. That's who you are. Praise the Lord. Now listen to me. Now, it's been discovered, even in our time, people are not looking for people who will come and add more trouble to their company. You say, why are you not employed? If you are going to be a solution, they will take you quickly. Everybody is looking for a solution provider. You get what I'm saying to you? Now, if you come to this church, and you are going to add value to this church, my friends, we won't let you go. But if you're going to be a problem, <laughs> we'll be praying you. <laughs> Lord, send them away. So while we are looking for more people to come to church, 
We are also looking for people who will add. That's why when you stay in the church for a while, I believe if you have stayed in the church for six months of consistently hearing the word of God, you should become a solution provider. You should be able to say, which department can I belong to? If there's a training, you go through the training so that you can also contribute your quarter. The reason why God brought you here is not so that you can, ah, Pastor Fumi is a wonderful pastor. I love her. Then you, after every Sunday you come here, every weekday service you are here, every program you are here, and then when you finish, you say, praise God, you go. No. Am I communicating? We are not an island. Or if you like, a lake. It is said that lake only take, but they don't give. So be a river. A river receives and flows. How many of you know that River Niger and Benue eventually receives and then eventually they flow all the way back to the sea? The Atlantic Ocean. I don't know if I'm communicating. So the, you, are, you are like a traffic water. That's what your life should be. Okay? Now, listen to me, listen to me. God wants every one of us to be a provider or an answer to a question. So, this is what I'm saying, so before I go further. So, every manufacturer, every inventor, human inventors wait until there is a problem. Then they say, eh, there's a problem. How many of you know that in the days of Jesus, there was no microphone? So, preaching didn't start when microphones were created. But somebody must have seen that ah, people are talking, but we, everybody can hear them. So, from there, invention occurred. Now, but you know what? Our father does not wait to be a problem to invent. He foresaw the problem. He noticed the problem from eternity past. So he waited and then created you. Now, so when we discover who we are created to be, that is what you call you. You have just discovered your assignment. What is your assignment? Your assignment is what you are created to do. What problem are you here to solve? Praise the Lord. That's what you are here for. Now, but that's not what the, the part I'm, I'm going to major on. But that scripture we read in Romans chapter 11, verse 29, it says, For the gifts and the calling of God, they are without repentance. In other words, God does not change his mind about them. The gifts, 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 the gifts. We talked about gifts this morning. That's why I'm going along this way. I believe the Lord wants me to go along that line and because of what I saw earlier in the morning. Now, the gifts, plural, calling, singular. You remember I said the gifts are what? Thank you. They are your equipment. Your calling is what? Assignment. Assignment. Praise the Lord. Now, we can as well read it this way and say, your gifts. Praise the Lord. Amen. Your gifts represents your endowment. Your calling represents your assignment. I already said that. Your gift is your ability. Your calling is your job description. So, your gift is what? Your abilities. Your calling is your job description. Now, how many of you know that when you are employed in a place, they will give you your job description? You will know your job description. They say, what are you employed to do? You say, I don't know. They just employ me. It means you are not employed. I like the way that brother is laughing. Which means you understand what I am saying. Okay, what are you employed to do? You say, well, mm -hmm, mm, just, 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 no. no, no, no. What did they write? What did they write? There's something that should be written. Even if you are not doing it, you know, but at least something was written. When they were giving you your letter of employment, what did they write? What did they say? That is your job description. Now, in God, God has job description for everyone. You know why? So that you don't enter my own job and be doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and then I'm doing yours. So you know your job description. And then when you know your job description, you can stay with your job description. And through it, God can be glorified. 
Now, let me say this to you. Let me just say this to you. God will not reward us for how many people, okay, you know. God will not reward you for how many people you know. God will reward you for how faithful you are to what he has assigned you to do. Let's assume that this microphone decides not to function. What do we do? What do we do? Thank you. You replace it. You drop this one and pick another one. Praise the Lord. If the manufacturer cannot handle it, cannot repair it, the you know, inventor, you understand, manufacturer, cannot deal with it, what do they do? They drop it. Why? Because the purpose for which it was created or fun it was supposed to function, it's not functioning that way. So therefore, we look for some others and replace it. Is that not so? Praise the Lord. Because service must continue. One microphone cannot stop us from having micro. Uh, so we have many other microphones. Now, but you see, the funny thing about God is that God doesn't have many people to do the assignment. Hmm. You know what that means? Which means God is so confident that you will not fail him. Do you know God believes in you more than you believe in yourself? Wow. That's why God didn't mass produce humans. He made one man. From one man pulled out the woman. From the woman eventually, you know, before the earth was populated by human beings. But when God was creating the fishes, how did he do? He said, let them produce in abundance. But when he came to man, why? That is to, ask, that is to tell you that God has a specific thing each human being is supposed to do. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Praise the Lord. Now, I don't want to stay with that. I just want to stay with the gifts and then, you know, try to um, look at one or two things that can make us discover this, some of these giftings in our lives. Now, so the gifts and the calling of God are without, are without what? Repentance. God does not withdraw his irrevocable. God does not withdraw his mind or change his mind about them. Now, watch. So there are many gifts, but there's one what? Assignment. You don't have many assignments. You only have one assignment. Now, what are gifts? That's what I want to do. What the scripture is saying is that if you can locate, if you can discover, your, if you can locate your giftings, your giftings will point you to your assignment. That's what he's saying. So God does not make you come in contact with your assignment. He doesn't, you don't discover your assignment just from day one. No. He gives you gifts. So that through those gifts, you will be able to come in contact with what? Your assignment. Is that clear to you now? All right. So let's give one or two examples in scripture. Sometimes we confuse the two together. Now you remember we read this morning about the gift of grace? You remember we read from, or this afternoon I think, from Ephesians chapter 4, you remember that? And I think around verse 8 thereabout. The gift of what? Of grace. Which means there are, these are gifts of grace or grace or gifts of Christ, whatsoever you want to call them. Praise the Lord. Now, and then under that, we discover that he mentioned apostle, evangelist, I mean, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, as one of them. Is that right? Yeah. Now, let me say to you that many times, um, you know, we normally um, mix them up. And sometimes you hear people say things like, um, I am called to be an apostle. No. In the real sense of it, if we are looking based on the scripture, you are not, because if you, what you are saying is, I'm, an ass, I'm assigned to be an apostle. There's nobody that is assigned to be an apostle. The right thing should be, I am gifted an apostle. Because there are many apostles. What are you assigned to do? So, you can be an apostle Paul, but apostle Paul is different from apostle Peter. Why? Because of their assignment. So, their calling is not, or their assignment is not the apostolic ministry or office. No. 
The apostolic office is a gift. It's an equipment to enable them fulfill the assignment. You remember we said the gift are what? Equipment. Their endowment, their abilities. Oh, hallelujah. That's why we have many apostles. If not, we we'll only have one apostle. Because God does not call people, many people, to do the same. God does not call each of us. Okay, let me rephrase that. Each of us, we are assigned to do just one thing. There's only one person assigned to do one thing in a generation. Two people can't do it. If not, God is confused. Let's use example from scripture. Now, Jesus, all right, what was Jesus' How many of you can answer? You, I'm sure you know this. I'm sure, I'm sure you know that the assignment of Jesus was not to heal the sick. Was not to raise the dead. Was not to feed 5,000 people. No, 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 no. What was his assignment? To go to the cross, die, resurrect, and then eventually take his blood to the heavenly holies, holies, you know, and then eventually fulfill the claim of justice for our salvation. That was the reason. Listen to me. From the time that God said, the seed of the woman shall bruise you. That's the word God was saying. To the time Gabriel came and said to Mary, you are going to have a son. His name is going to be called Jesus. He will save the all that, listen to me, is just pointing to what? The one thing, which is the assignment or your job description. Jesus was not confused about his job description. When he was on earth, he kept talking about the cross. 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 I will pull this, I will pull this building down and build it in three days. He wasn't talking about the tabernacle or the temple of Solomon. No, he was talking about his body. Hallelujah. Now, but watch this. Did Jesus have gifts? Yes. What were the gifts? Every other thing he did were gifts. His assignment was one. What was his assignment? Now, Jesus lived the earth for how many years? Three? I thought you said three years. Okay, so 33 years. Now, we understand that Jesus did ministry, public ministry, for, for three years. So for 30 years, Jesus was here. What was he doing? Or if you like, for the 33 years, what was Jesus doing? Because how many of you know that after Jesus died, not too long after then he went? We didn't hear that Jesus decided to stay again and continue. He has done his job. That's why I believe this, that how long or how short you live, it's good to exercise faith, because, but it's also determined by your assignment. Because why do you want to stay if you are finished, my friend? If this microphone, by the time we close this service, the microphone says, no, I still want to continue to talk. <laughs> we say we have closed. He say, no, no, I, I still want to be here. Well, we have to drop it. Is that not so much? Yeah. Oh, drop it. And say, good night, everybody. If you like, continue. Walk. Come and stay here. We will know whose voice you want to amplify. There will be nobody. Praise the Lord. Now, so watch what I'm going to show you. Jesus feeding the 5,000 was not his assignment. Oh, are you understanding me? Yes. That wasn't his job description. So why did God allow that to happen? Those were expression of the gift or gifts of God in his life. Are you with me? Okay, so we know that his assignment was that. But see when Jesus fulfilled his assignment. Did he do that, you know, when he was 31? Huh? No. Did he do that when he was 32? No. He did that at the end. Because you see, your assignment will be concluded towards the end of your life. And when it is done, you will know it's time to go. Do you understand me? Yes. All right, let's take some good examples from scripture, and then we'll minister to one or two people today. Let's take Joseph. Oh, can I go to Joseph? Okay, let's leave Joseph alone. Let's take um, Noah. How many of you remember Noah? Now, how many of you know that Noah 
was assigned by God to build um, an ark. Present day, we call it a very big ship, right? That will accommodate all the animals in the world, male and female. Now, if you have that assignment, and let me quickly say this to you, that's wonderful. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God will never give you an assignment that you can accomplish by your might. It will be bigger than you. You'll be saying, God, how? So God told a man, can you imagine that you are asked to build a ship? That we accommodate all the animals in the world, male and female. How many of you know there are animals? All animals are not in Africa. There are some that we don't have in Africa. Tiger, for example, don't live in Africa. They stay in Asia. They are not of the origin of Africa. Lions, you don't find lions. Typically, if you find them in Asia, they took them from Africa there. Lions stay in this neighborhood in Africa. Elephants, you will find them either in Africa or some part of Asia. You won't find them in Europe. Do you get what I'm saying to you? Praise the Lord. Now, in the same way, there are some animals you will not find. But can you imagine God asking you to build an ark? The first thing you will ask yourself is, okay, okay. How big am I going to build it? Did you know it's very funny that God gave him the dimension? That's why, see, when God assigns you, he will tell you how. You will miss it when you want to use your computer mind. You say, ah, okay, I know. Well, <laughs> you miss it. You build something so small because your mind is too small compared to the mind of God. He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. They are your ways, my ways. So, he, he, you know, so, 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 so I'm just trying to make you understand. So God will give you something that is larger than you. When you think about it, you say, God, where do I start from? How do I end it? Now, that's one way you get to know that what you have received is of God. God will never tell you things that you can do by yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? God will never tell you that. So understand, that's one way you get to know that God is the one speaking. So God tells you, for example, he says, well, I'm going to make you a minister of the federal capital. <laughs> you say, me? From where? How? Who do I know? I'm not even a politician. Oh, God doesn't follow that. Does God need politics to do what he wants to do? Oh, no, 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 no. But you see, like we said, you believe the word of God. And then God begins to tutor you. He begins to prepare you. God begins to connect you with people. All right? And then these things begin to build. It begins to build. It begins to build. Then eventually you come into it. Then you look back and say, oh, God really said this. See where I am today. But at the beginning, you were looking at yourself. How? Who do I know? And really, you don't know anybody. But how many of you know that when God says something, you don't need to know anybody? Remember Mary? Oh, it's not going to happen by the instrumentality of any man. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest shall. That's what you need. If the Holy Spirit is with you, if the power of the highest overshadows you, you will surely come into the fullness of what he has said. And you know what? Every time God speaks to you, when you talk to other people, they will laugh at you. <laughs> we think you ate too much pounded yam. That's why you are talking the way you are talking. You remember Joseph? He told his brothers. Oh, some laughed at him. Some were angry. He said, look at him. He's the favorite son. Now he's even saying that we are, going to, we are going to bow to him. Let's sell him. Let's kill him. Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right. So, Noah was asked to build the ark, so he built. How many years did it take Noah to build the ark? You know how many years? Over 100 years. About 120 years. Now, listen. Listen. I want you to see something there. How many of you know that his assignment was not to preach for people to be saved? God didn't say, hello, Mr. Noah, I want you to preach to this generation. Ah, God just told him, build an ark. 
Did he preach? Did anybody get saved? Was he successful? Yes, because he did what God told him. Your success is not tied to what people think. It's tied to what God told you to do. If I assign you here and I said, every morning, come by 8 a.m. and sweep the whole place. And you did that every day for 30 days or 31 days. Will I be able to say you are successful? Yes. Now, do you qualify for a reward? Or a payment? Yes. Why? But let's assume the person came, ate, and kept walking around the whole of this place. Kept walking around the whole of this compound. And just looking at people and greeting them. Hello, it's good to have you here. We would like you to be in church on Sunday. Now, are we going to pay him? Why? That's not what we are assigned him to do. So God will pay you for what he assigned you to do. If you do something else, God will not pay you. Oh, very strict. God is very strict when it comes to that. Because he doesn't want you to do somebody's job. Because in doing somebody's job, you are taking somebody's place. There's going to be schism in the body. Hallelujah. Amen. And he doesn't want there to be his problem in the church, in his universal church. So he wants you to do your own, do your own so that others can also do their place. But yours is tied to many people. You remember we said that earlier, praise the Lord. So Noah built... The ark. Now, when he finished building the ark, listen to me, the next thing was getting the animals in. You think Noah went everywhere to be looking for animals? No. What did he do? Lord, I finished. What did God do? He brought the animals. Two by two. Two by two. Some came all the way from Asia. Some from Europe. Some from Africa. Some from Australia. Kangaroos are found only in Australia. You don't find them anywhere in the world. If you see them anywhere in the world, they took them from, from, from Australia. Do you get what I'm saying to you? No. And he brought them two by two. Two by two. Who brought them, sir? God. Why? God is cooperating with you as you are cooperating with him. As you are doing your part, God is bringing what you need. Part time, part time. But did you know that Noah was not a shipbuilder? So who helped him build the ship? Huh? Okay, yeah, God. But the people of his generation that he was preaching to, there's going to be rain. They say, foolish man. Have you ever seen rain fall? The same people who didn't believe his preaching helped him to build. Because at that time, there were shipbuilders. This is what God said I should do. Where did he get the resource from? God dropped the money from heaven. Because if he was to build sheep, he would spend money. Don't you think so? How did he get the timber? How did he get, you understand? And God specifically told him the kind of wood he should use. Guava wood. How many of you know that the people who gave him some of the money he needed to build were in that generation that perished? That's why when you face your assignment, God can move even stingy people to give to you. You remember Elijah? Elijah. Elijah was by the brook. And ravens, go and Google, just take time to Google and find out about ravens. Ravens are very selfish birds. Mother raven will eat first. Be full before even considers her young. That's the attitude they have. So, now, but God was using stingy, very selfish bird to bring meat to his prophet. And they were obeying morning and evening. Morning and evening. Lord, how come those birds were not eating the meat they were given? Because you see, when God is in charge, even stingy people will give to your ministry. That's why, listen to me, don't be bothered about how we're going to do it. No, 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 no. Just focus on God. Stay with God and keep at it. Pastor Fumi, I believe the Lord will want me to say this to you. He said, the things that you want to see, they will all manifest. But focus on the things that I have spoken to you and stay with them. 
Because I'm hearing the Spirit of God is saying for me to tell you. He said, those things that you want to see, those things will fall in line. He said, don't be bothered about them. Focus on the things that I have given you to do as you stay with them. I hear the Spirit of God saying for me to say to you that I will bring in the harvest. And I will bring in the supply. And I'm understanding the Spirit of God saying for me to say to you that even the movement that is about to happen to the new place, say of the Spirit of God, you'll find that all that I will do by myself. And I'm understanding the Lord saying for me to tell you in the new place there will also be an opening, say of the Spirit of God regarding where the church eventually will be sighted and where the church will be built. For I hear the Spirit of God saying, before you came, I had made those things and I've arranged them. Walk in the plan that I have given to you and everything will fall in line, say you're the Spirit of God. For remember, remember, remember that even I, when I wanted a coat that had never been ridden before, Remember that I sent my servants and I said to them, go and untie it. If anyone asks you, tell them that the Lord has need of them. For I hear the Spirit of God saying, the things you need are in the hands of others. But when the time comes, they will untie it and bring it to you. Say of the Spirit of God. There's great days of great rejoicing that is coming to this church. Say of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, back to what we are teaching. Now, so, so you understand that Noah built that ark. God brought the, the animals when it was time. How many of you know that God will not bring the animal until the ark is finished? And you know what? God was not going to bring down the rain until the ark was finished. Hallelujah. Now, let's assume that Noah was praying, Father, this generation, eh, they don't want to believe me. Oh. Can you just make rain fall small, Lord? Small, small. So that they will know. You know, sometimes we pray like that. We men of God, we pray like that. Oh. We pray like that. Lord, let them know that you have really called us. Just, just, just let, let something happen. So that by the time we pray, they will really know that we are God. No, God won't do that. Just focus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, how many of you know God will not? God, let them know. I've been talking about this rain going to fall. They are laughing at me. Lord. Just small, small. Just for five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> now, you know why? Because everything is delayed until you fulfill your assignment. Oh, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Hear me. Some of the predicaments we find ourselves, even as a nation, is because people have no reason to their assignment. You know, there are people who have political assignment. Or giftings, no, not political. They have political giftings, but they have not recognized it. You know, there was a time in the church, you know, where people, they will tell people in the church, when a man wants to go to politics, your pastor will say, Dirty, don't go there, I bet. Now, that's why the church in Nigeria is backward. See the way they are mesmerizing us. Who do you find in politics? But the, this morning you quoted a scripture, that scripture. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Light is supposed to be where? Thank you. You are not light if you stay in the midst of light. We don't need you there. Can you imagine me now turning on my flashlight on my phone with this light illumination we have here? Will it, even you, you'll be looking at what is wrong with uh, Something must be wrong with this pastor. And I'm looking at it is what? inconsequential. We don't need it. But if the place is dark, you can turn on your flashlight. It will make meaning. Yes, we are not supposed to shine in the midst of light. You don't have light in the midst of light. You are supposed to be in the dark. So it is where it gets darkest. That's where we are supposed to go to. But Christians are running away from darkness and we are staying in light. No, that's not God's agenda for his kingdom. Arise, shine, for thy light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Is that not so? He said there will be darkness upon thee and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon you. So what are you supposed to do? You are supposed to go there. But you see, you don't go there because you just want to go there. You will go there because you are called there. So, until we begin to understand that, there are certain changes we will not make. Hallelujah. 
Now, can you imagine that the church in Nigeria had known this earlier? The political landscape will have been determined by the church. And you know what? When people don't rise to the occasion, non-entities are pushed there by the devil. That's why the wisest people are being ruled by foolish people. In a land where wise people decide not to speak, not to be wise, foolish men will take them for a ride. That's what we have in our nation. That's what we have in Nigeria. And people are saying Nigeria is to be, supposed to be the giant of Africa. I agree with you. We have so much light. We have so much, we have Christians, but we are not rising. Why? Because we are running away from light and, I mean, running away from darkness and trying to keep ourselves in the midst of light. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, so the, your gift. So what was Noah's gift? Now, his gift was the ability to build that ark. The ability to segment that ark. Because in that ark, did you remember that in that ark, both the goat and the lion were staying together. And the lion was not looking for the goat to eat. Isn't it funny? Tiger was there. Hyena was there. Huh? And all sorts of the cat family, as we call it. But they were not looking for goat to eat. So for those number of days that they were there, what were they eating? They went back to the original. They were eating vegetables. Because that was how God originally intended it. Before man fell, a lion was not looking for good. In the garden, no lion was looking for good to eat. It was the fall that brought that. Okay. Nobody was looking for anybody to kill. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't offend. There's nothing Eve can do to offend Adam. And nothing Adam can do to offend because I told you it was the uh, dispensation of innocence. Nothing was wrong. Nothing. You understand what I'm saying? That's what we'll go back to in the new Jerusalem. Amen. There will be nothing wrong. We'll just go back there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, let's take an example and then uh, maybe share one or two other things and then we'll minister. Trust God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's take Joseph as a good example. Joseph had an assignment, but he had many, he had gifts. Now, there are two prominent gifts. There are more than that, but you can see two prominent gifts in the life of Joseph. One, he had a spiritual gift of uh, dreams, which means God speaking to him by dream is a gift. Is that okay? So in his father's house, he had a dream, two dreams. I believe Joseph had more than two dreams, but two were spoken about. Why? Because all his dreams were connected. So he had two dreams. He saw his father, I mean, he saw himself in the midst of his brothers. Okay, you remember that? Eleven sheaves, and they were bowing to his. And then he also said he saw the sun, the moon, all right, and the star. And what were they doing? They were bowing to his own star. His brothers interpreted, he didn't interpret like I said this morning. His father, when he told his father, the Bible says his father rebuked him and, you know, rebuked him. But he also thought about it. And he felt there must be something about what this boy is saying. So, the other thing you'll find that Joseph had was that he had an administrative skill. In his father's house, he started building it, developing it. He discovered that he had the administrative gift, ability to manage things. All right? That's why his father sent him, even though the last born at that time, sent him to go and oversee his brothers, or the second to the last. Why was he an overseer? Why did they make him an overseer? Joseph was not going to the field to go and stay with 
you know, the, the family, you know, uh, the cattle. No, but he was going there to check his brothers out. And maybe you'll come back and bring a right report. How many of you know that people generally don't like those managers, those people? <laughs> so you are not the first. They don't like them. They don't like people who try to write about them. When the person enters, you see everybody say, like, hey, don't come, don't come. Now. They are the ones that checkmate you. They put you in your rightful place. Mm-hmm. So we must have them. There are people who are gifted like that. When you enter a place, you just see disorganization. And you want to arrange everything. Uh, and put them in their rightful places. Praise the Lord. So generally speaking, people don't like them. Even in church, people don't like them. So no, no, no. I want to sit anyhow. No. But well, those people are like that. Now, so we see those two prominent gifts... In the life of Joseph. Now, but what was Joseph's assignment? His assignment was just one thing. Now, but let's see how God took him. We will see more gifts as I begin to talk. Joseph in his father's house had a dream, right? He was also an administrator because he was taking care of his father's or overseeing his brothers. You remember? All right. Now, so he will come back, give the report. Now, eventually, Joseph was sold. Now, when he was sold, uh, he was sold to... The Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelites, then to the Egyptians, and eventually, okay? So, Joseph found himself in Egypt. You remember that? Now, in Egypt, Joseph was bought by Potiphar. Potiphar came and bought him. Okay? Now, when Potiphar came to buy Joseph, um, Joseph didn't have any particular qualification. It wasn't like jo- I mean, Potiphar bought him because of any particular qualification. Because in the slave market, what will you say? Maybe it's the physical physique they look for. So maybe he had it. But that's not what I think. This is what I believe. That God orchestrated the plan, the movement of Joseph. You know why? Because God knew that the dream he gave to Joseph will not be fulfilled in Canaan. Canaan didn't have the technical know-how to sustain food in the year of famine. They didn't have it. The, 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 the technological breakthroughs were in Egypt at that time. Do you understand? So God gave him a dream that will not be fulfilled in Canaan. How many of you know if Joseph had prayed, oh God, just let me fulfill this dream in Canaan, he would have missed God? Because that dream won't happen there. Where was it going to happen? Egypt. So God, he was in Canaan, God was speaking. So you can be here and God will be speaking to you about America. And vice versa. It's possible. All right. So, Joseph eventually found himself in Potiphar's house. The first thing you find Joseph doing in Potiphar's house was that Joseph didn't interpret any dream. Neither did he dream in Potiphar's house. Maybe he did. We are not told. But Joseph started doing what? He started organizing Potiphar's business. So, you see his administrative skills or his managerial skills. Playing out his gift. And the Bible says Potiphar became, was, his business was doing well because of, why was he doing well because of Joseph? Because a man discovered his gift. And he was using that gift. And that gift was promoting the business or expounding the business of Potiphar. Then later we see Joseph because Potiphar's wife, you know that story very well, so I don't need to go through that. We saw Joseph in the prison. When Joseph came into the prison, you know his administrative gift was still working. All right? Now, Joseph was not the head of the prison. He was the head of the prisoners. Joseph had a say in even the type of food they will eat. Why? They just saw a man who, is an, who has an administrative ability. They saw a man who was born to be a leader. And suddenly began to decide. And he wasn't deciding things wrongly. He was doing the right thing. We never had that when Joseph was in prison, there was riot. Because he was in charge. Then one day, his friends, you know, his two inmates, had a dream. Both of them had served the king. All right? The cupbearer. And who is the next man? The baker. All right. Now, both of them had a dream. 
Both of them were sorrowful. And then Joseph asked them, what is wrong? Eventually, Joseph, which means Joseph was a man who took, who took interest in people. Because if you're a manager, you will take interest in your people. Even though they were not paying him for being a prisoner. But yet he was interested in people. So why? He, he just noticed, ah, what happened to you? You were cheerful yesterday night. And then push, push. The people said, okay, we had a dream. And this is the dream. Mm. From nowhere, Joseph had never interpreted publicly. Joseph started receiving interpretation into their dreams. And he said, oh, one of you will be restored. The other one will be killed. Sorry. And it happened according to the interpretation. Now, then the Bible says eventually, Joseph was sought for by Pharaoh. You remember Pharaoh was looking for him because Pharaoh had a dream. Now, this is very interesting. You know what? God will always take you towards the direction of fulfilling his purpose or God's purpose in your life. And the way he does that is that God will create an uh, impossible situation that only you can answer to. That's the way God works. If not, you won't get there. So Pharaoh had a dream. He couldn't interpret the dream. His uh, magicians, his astrologers, his soothsayers, they couldn't interpret the dream. He looked for wise men of his generation. They couldn't interpret his dream. So suddenly, that inmate that was restored, they remembered. And said, ah, there's a man in your kingdom. He's actually in the prison now. He can interpret this dream. He said, okay, once, send for him. Now, I like what Joseph also did. This sometimes I discover that even we believers, we don't do these things. Now, Joseph, when he was sent for, do you know Joseph did not say, ha, 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 praise God. Oh, lama, kiss to pai, randa, se, se, ke, pa, 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 glory. No, that's not what Joseph did. What did he do? Joseph had studied that if peradventure, because he knew by revelation that he will one day go to Pharaoh's court. So Joseph knew that Pharaoh didn't like people with beards. And in the Jewish custom, keeping of beards, long one, is part of their tradition. Oh, go and look at orthodox Jews. Google it, you will see it. they have long beards. That's why we call some people Father Abraham. Abraham had beards. No, Abraham had beards. You can study it. You will know. You will know. They had beards. All right? Praise the Lord. In fact, Ezekiel, when you study about Ezekiel, you know that Ezekiel didn't only have beards. He had dreadlocks. John the Baptist also. Jesus also. And Jesus had beards. That's why they tore his beards on the cross. So he had beards too. Is a Jewish custom. Now, so for Joseph to shave, ah, that's a taboo. But why? Because of where I'm going to. Some of us, ah, no, ma, me, no, I, I can't do that. Ah. Then you are not ready to go to your place of assignment. You deal with certain things because of where God is taking you to. But sometimes we Christians are not wise to do that. So what did Joseph do? Joseph studied about Pharaoh. He studied about the palace. He knew the in and out. What did he do? So he shaved. Why? Pharaoh does not like people with beards. But you know, if it is some Christians today, they will say, don't worry. We'll go there like that. The Lord will not make concern. My friends, he doesn't like it. You know what? You will give the interpretation. And he will say, take him back to the prison. Because you are already infuriating him. He's angry with you. Even your presence alone. So you come and say the interpretation, they take you back. But you know what Joseph did? He shaved, changed his clothes. He didn't go with the prisoner's clothes. Because what Joseph was saying, I'm not coming back here. Now, if you are looking for employment, one of the things you must do is to understand where you are going to. There are many people, they don't study, they'll be reading other things. For example, you are looking for a job in Coca-Cola. And the first question they ask you is, when did Coca-Cola start? (laughs) 
In fact, I've discovered that majorly in interviews, it is not, they are not interested in your qualification first. That's why they want to talk to you. They want to see if you know about, because if you know about Coca-Cola, can you imagine they just ask you, or they didn't even ask you. They say, what do you know about Coca-Cola? You say, ah, Coca-Cola starting in so-so-so time. Um, Coca These things you can find on Google. You know what those people, they quickly mark you down. Huh? This one is a brain. This is the kind of person we, because we need somebody who will contribute to us, who will uh, add value to us, not somebody who will come and, no, bring us down, no. Do you understand? So, if you are going for an interview, know about the place. Can you imagine, let's assume that pastors, we know we don't do that, but let's assume that um, Metamorphosis Christian Center show, you know, have an advert. We are looking for pastors, you know, this is the qualification, this, 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 this. You must have gone to either Bible school, you must have a genuine call, and then, na, 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 na. And then we have 500 pastors here. And then you start the interview. Hello, so what do you know about metamorphosis? Well, metamorphosis simply means transformation. That's all. Now, but who will you pick, Pastor Fumi? Somebody comes and says, oh, metamorphosis started on so, so, so day. It started here, and this is where it has been. Won't that shock you? You will not need somebody who has been following me. I need such person. You will quickly pull that person close. The person may not have two, two. He may have only pass. You will still pull the person. Why? This person that knows us this well, we won't do much for him to be here. Do you understand what I'm saying? But you ask somebody, he says, mm, metamorphosis? I think it means... No, you won't get that job. <laughs> All right, so let's finish about Joseph. So Joseph eventually got to the Pharaoh's court. Now, watch. When he got to Pharaoh's court, he entered the place with changed clothes, with shaved beards. He was asked, is it true that you can't appreciate this? He said, well, God will give us an answer of peace. Amen. And so finally, Joseph brought the interpretation. He had the, 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 the dream. And God gave him, that gift began to operate. So he told the king, he said, well, the dream you had is, you have two dreams, but both of them mean the same. And so he said, well, it simply means there's going to be seven years of abundance. All right? And then there's going to be seven years of famine. Then Joseph said, look in your realm for a man of understanding who we can set over this matter. He didn't say, pick me. Because that will be too direct. But look for a man in your realm who we will set over and let him build warehouses. See, Joseph who had the solution. <laughs> He knew the solution. And said, and let them build warehouses, filled, in these seven years of abundance, fill those uh, uh, warehouses up with food. And then in the second year, I mean the year of famine, so that at that time we'll begin to dish out food. Then we won't suffer this lack. Hallelujah. Amen. Did that happen? Then the Bible says the time came when the children of Israel now had to leave Canaan to come and buy food in Egypt. There was serious famine in Canaan. So they had to come to Egypt. Now when they came, his brothers came. They didn't recognize him. He recognized them. Why? They never expected that Joseph would be there. But you know, it's very funny. Joseph was 17 when he had his dream. So at least they saw somebody who had lived with them for 17 years plus. And yet they didn't recognize him. You know why? In their mind, they, they thought Joseph had died. So they didn't in ever envisage that Joseph can be there. Joseph immediately saw them. He knew, Kai, see my brothers. You know why Joseph was not angry with them? Because Joseph knew that this journey is a journey to fulfilling the assignment. 
Why will you be angry with somebody who is instrumental? No, you will get angry with somebody who is trying to stop you. Is that not so? But he didn't need to be angry with them. He had the right spirit because he knew you will see him say that later. All right? So eventually his brothers know. Eventually he revealed himself, I am Joseph. When they had Kai, they fainted. Not like fainted, fainted. You understand? Like, hey, truly, he looks like he's Joseph. And now they became very sorry. Hey, please forgive us. Please, please. You know, actually, it was the devil. I'm sure you know that's the word. The devil got into us. You know, we didn't plan it. All right. And then eventually, they, you know, <laughs> Joseph said something interesting. He said, hey, guys, listen. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. But this is it. He said, what you people don't know is that you were instrumental to sending me ahead so that I can fulfill my assignment. What is this assignment? To preserve the posterity of Israel. Period. What was Joseph's assignment? Just to be in a position where he can keep Israel alive so that they won't die because of starvation. Did he fulfill his assignment? After then, did you hear much about Joseph again? Joseph died. Now, so, the throne or sitting as the next in command to Pharaoh is still a gift. It's not the assignment. But he needed that seat to fulfill his assignment. The dream was a gift. The administrative ability was a gift. All that were gifts. They were not the assignment. The assignment was to keep, to be in the place so that he can preserve the posterity of Israel. Because if Joseph was not there, oh, Canaan would have finished. The, the children of Israel would have died in Canaan. Because the Bible says the famine in Canaan was severe. Why? Jesus was looking at the, God was looking at the bigger picture. What was the bigger picture? Jesus. Jesus. What was the bigger picture? Jesus and the church. That was the bigger picture. Because he knew if, 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 if Jacob and his children had died, there will not have been anybody that will produce Christ. Because Christ was not going to come from the Gentile nation. It was going to come from the Jewish tribe. And the Jewish tribe has just been wiped out. So God will have to go back again and start planning. No. He didn't need to do that. Now, if you have that understanding, it means you too, you have a part to play in the bigger picture. Yes, sir. You are not here for yourself. I am not here for myself. God has enlisted me to play a part in that bigger picture. Now, how many of you have seen people who, you know, what do you call it? Um, this um, uh, live drama. Is that what it's called? These people who act. Page, stage play. Yeah, that's it. Now, I'm sure you know, when you go for, um, no, no audition. When you go to watch it, stage play, theater, thank you. When you go to a theater and you see them playing, how many of you know that everybody has his scene? The person who started may never come back again. Sometimes the person will come back. All right? So if it starts with one person, we wait. The person will be the action. Everybody is watching him. He's doing everything he needs to do, you know, and everything is happening. Is that not so? Yes. If he needs to sing some songs, he will be singing that song during that time. After that period is part, what happens? <laughs> what happens? Another person comes. That's what we are here to do. We are not here for showmanship. You are playing your part. Pastor Fumi is playing her part today. Tomorrow it may not be Pastor Fumi, it may be you. So you do your part. When it is time to go, you exit. That's what life is all about. So we are, we are all playing a part in this theater. What did you call it again? Stage play of God. Divine stage play. Abraham had played his part. He went. Today we are reading it. Isaac came, played his own. Jacob came, played his own. Moses came, played his own. You understand what I'm saying? Joseph came, played his own. Everybody's playing their part. You, this is our own time now, so you play your own. Because very soon, you won't be here anymore. If Jesus tarries, 
we will soon say, oh, we used to know somebody by the name Joseph Akaya. Oh, he man, that man was a great blessing. That's what it will be. If you live longer than me, you will say that. If you can come for my burial, you will come. If you can't come, you say, oh, a great man. We thank God for his life. He has blessed me. That's, is that not what you say? Have you not said that about many people? Yes, you will say that. So my own path will go. And you can't pray to keep me. One man who tried to stay. All right? He started doing other things. His name is Solomon. How many of you know that Solomon didn't build only one temple? He built many temples because the Bible says his wives, strange wives, what did they do? They took his heart away from God. So every wife, the one that came from Egypt, say, ah, in my own place, this is the God we serve. So when they bring their God, you build temple for them. Why did God, why? Was Solomon chosen to be a king? No! To build the tabernacle. Go and ask David, he will tell you. David wanted to build the tabernacle. God said, no, that's not your assignment. You are a man of war. You have shared blood. When God says that, it doesn't mean you are a war. You are, you are, you are, how do I put Huh? A murderer. No, that's not what God was referring to. God was simply saying, your ministry is your place your assignment is to be a warrior, to take the territories that even Joshua couldn't take. That's your job. And go and read. You'll find out that when David became king, he took territories that God promised Abraham that Joshua couldn't take. He took them. That's his assignment. What was Saul's assignment? Thank you. That was his assignment. He failed. The Amalekites. Very simple. Kill the Amalekites. You know what the man did? The man went there. He went to keep the king. You know why? He wanted to fuel his pride. So that by the time Saul said, hey, Saul. Then you see Agag coming with him. They were pulling him. Hmm? He will fall down. They will pull him. You know how they do? I'm sure you have watched those ancient war films before. When you capture people, you know, prisoners, what do you do to them? People will be throwing stones at them. Oh, oh, oh. That's what he wanted to see. He was foiling his pride. Can you see what I have done? He missed God. When God said to him, kill all. If there's a pregnant woman, kill the woman. Open her womb, kill. And you know, because of that mistake, go and read. You will find that that was how the son of Agagite survived. What's his name? Okay, you still remember. Haman. That's how Haman survived. Haman was a product of the king. All right? Akish. I'm sorry. Uh, what did I call his name? Now? Huh? Agag. Agag or Agag, anyone. Agag was a king, all right, of the Amalekites that was brought who had opportunity to sleep with a slave girl in Israel. And that's how that man was created. Who became problem for them? Thank God for Esther. And you know Esther did too, didn't recognize her assignment. She thought, I just married the king. Ah, no problem. You know, we just here to have cozy life. The uncle say, hey, hey, hello. They will kill us. They will also come for you because they will know that you are a Jew. Maybe this is the reason why God brought you to the throne for a, such a time. That was when she woke up. He said, pray. Let's fast. I'll go to see. Did you hear about Esther after then? Did you hear about that? Because that's the reason why God... Can you imagine all the beauty pageant that went on? Those were gifts. The beauty of her being selected, those were gifts. Pointing to just one thing. So that the children of Israel will not be destroyed. What is your own assignment? But well, you need to understand the gift. In other words, when you know your gift, you will know your assignment. I'll say two things, and then you can build the rest. I trust Pastor Fumi has been teaching you a lot here. Number one, if you want to discover your gift, be faithful where you have been humanly assigned. Did you hear what I said? Where you, where you have been humanly assigned. When I say humanly assigned, which means... Not the Holy Spirit telling you. Pastor Fumi can just say, uh, my brother, can you go and join the music department? Don't say, ah, me? I don't have a voice. So. My voice is so hey, hey, hey. You don't know what Pastor Fumi has seen. 
go and join it. And you know what? Be faithful there. Come for the rehearsals. Do you understand what I'm saying? Be faithful there. Give your best to it. Through it, you will discover your gift. Am I communicating? You know, it's funny that God uses men to shape us. Some of you today, you can appreciate the reason why your parents were strict with you. You say, my parents, eh? Kai, very strict. Today, you are appreciating it. You don't know why they were strict. And you know, sometimes, even in a family, you don't know the reason why. In fact, in some families, you will think, am I really? Are they the ones that gave back to me? Because your younger ones, they seem to be softer. You don't know. Now you can appreciate. You know why? God was training you. Now you can appreciate it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know why God had to take Joseph out of Canaan? If you leave Joseph to Jacob, Jacob will spoil that boy. Because he will be waking up very late, eating the best meal. He has a coat of many colors. <laughs> so God said, mm, 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 mm. oh yeah, but in, angels arrange how this boy will be sent to Egypt. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying to you? But today you appreciate. You know, I, well, I was raised by my parents until age, I think age four, age four, age four, age five. So I went to stay with my sister. All right? Now, but today I appreciate being raised there. Okay? The last time I was in Kano, <laughs> uh, last year, sometime in November, um, that's where I grew up. So I told the people who hosted me, you know, I said, okay, um, I just want a free day. On a Saturday morning, we finished the meeting. I said, okay, just drive me around. I want to show you some things. You know, sometimes when you teach people and you are talking, they don't, some of them think you have always been here. They don't know that you have been here too. So I said, okay, let me show you some things. Follow me because there are, are people I know, you know, they've been following our ministry. So I took them, I showed them the first house we lived when I arrived, Kano, 1973. I showed them the first house we lived and then I showed them the other house that we lived, you know, and so on and so forth. I was showing them all the houses that we lived. I'm like, ah, pastor, you still remember? I said, oh, yeah. They are just like the back of my heart, can I forget? Even though houses, you know, development has come, but I could still, you know, find my way, and I was showing them. I showed them the primary school, the first primary school I went to, it was called SIM then. Sudan Interior Mission, that's what it was called, before it became Ekwa. I showed them the school, it's called Kundila Estate now, or something, it's Kundila Primary School. And then I told them the secondary school I wanted to enter before they say I must change my name to either Ibrahim or Mohammed or something. Okay, so they told me that. My sister said, no, no, no. So I went to Quara State now to go to my secondary school. Now, but I said that just to make you understand that the path that God takes you through, all is to develop you. There's no path. Sometimes I met a sister. Oh, let me stop here. But I met a sister, one sister, who um, took care of her sister's children. All right? And he said, those years, she used to be angry. She felt her sister, or really not her sister, her auntie, was very wicked towards her. Because when people are going to school, she will go to school, when she returns, she started taking care of the baby. She took care of the first, the second, six children. She was the one that catered for them. This sister didn't know, this lady didn't know that God was training her. So eventually she grew, married, had her own children, and you know, decided to go to UK that year to go and do one of these uh, vacation jobs. You know, during the long vac, normally then you can go to UK, you, if you have visa, people give you a job. And so this lady went. Now watch what happened. Now. When this lady got there, she was looking for a job. Looking for a job. 
the first month, no job. You know, long vac used to be just about three months, then about two months plus. So, first month, no job. Second month was going no job. Towards the end of second month, just about entering the third month that she's been there, and you know, her family was here. She wanted to go make more money to help, you know, cushion the effect of financial burden, you know, in Nigeria. And this lady went to UK. So, no job. She was not planning to come back. So, one day, she went to a place. And where she went to, uh, I think she was trying to check, you know, if she could also get a job probably and see if there was something she could do. And then she got there. And when she got there, listen to my story. She got there. And then there was this woman who came with uh, her baby. You know, maybe like two years, there about. Maybe a year, a year plus, a year, six months, there about. And then this lady, this baby will cry and cry and cry and cry. And this, you know, the mother of the baby needed to do things. So she would give the baby to, ow, ow. So she couldn't do much. So this lady walked to her and said, please, can I help you? The woman turned to her and said, how? He said, just let me carry the baby. <laughs> he said, this baby. Well, anyway, okay. Let it not be that I'm, I'm refusing you. The baby was screaming and what, throwing tantrum. After a while, the lady just walked with the baby. The baby became quiet. Brought her back. He said, what did you do to this baby? What did you do to my child? He said, nothing. I just did what I've been trained to do. He said, how? He said, well, I raised my, children, my, my auntie's six children. And through that, I have developed some skill of how to handle you know what happened that woman took her like this by the hand he said follow me follow me he said did you say you want to go back to nigeria he said yes he said no you don't need to go back to nigeria we are going to keep you here you can start a crutch i'm going to get you a resident visa actually a working visa first and then eventually i'm going to get that for you don't worry you are not going back tell your family to move over that's how the lady relocated and her family to UK. What did that? But she used to think her sister was wicked. Now she appreciates her auntie. Oh, thank you, auntie, for this. <laughs> See what it did? Today she has a crutch. I think she has a nursery now, a primary school, you know, established in UK. Now, see how they did. So everything you are learning is important. Every path God takes you through is important. God is building you for the future. It's part of the things you need to fulfill your purpose or your destiny. Praise the Lord. 